to note this is he started out saying to those people, you search the scriptures. The word search really indicates some pretty careful study. And if there's anyone in this congregation or in the brotherhood in this area who likely would fit into that category, it could be some like you who come on Wednesday night to study. And that's the reason that's so sobering, including, I said, the teacher. People who search the scriptures were still missing something as strategic and vital as eternal life. Because those scriptures, if understood, if approached with the right motive, would have taken them to Christ, and he said, you will not come to me. Now, those here, if I were to stop and just call roll or ask each one, uh, are you one who would look to Christ? Are you one seeking eternal life? I imagine we'd come up with a hundred on both test questions. Every one of you would say, yes, I am searching the scriptures. Yes, I do want eternal life. And the sobering thing is, that's who they were, and they were not getting with Christ. And that's the reason it's so sobering. It could happen to you, it could happen to me. We could float along through life, go to church services week after week, maybe even on Wednesday night, and still miss the master. Marty? Yeah, I hadn't even heard what you mentioned. That's never come up to me that uh, people were questioning uh, that Hebrews searched for because there are a number of old covenant passages. I can think of about three or four right now that point to an eternal relationship with God and hence eternal life. Uh, the body returns the dust from which it came, but the spirit returns to God who gave it. Uh, that sounds like going home. Yes, they had problems. But the problem I want us to pick up from this passage is you and I could be coming to services just like this and search the scriptures and still not really be following 1 Peter 2.21 real well. For here unto where you call because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. How well are we doing that one? That might determine with our attending Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and studying the scriptures, if we really are following the Christ. Just a sobering thought. So thought it would touch on that passage Another passage that's sobering in this context is Matthew, the 13th chapter, verses 10 through 17. Do you notice that? Jesus said to some, he was teaching in parables because of the nature and motive and attitude of those people. Their heart is wax gross. Waxed in that case is about like wax. You can't hardly get through it. And you couldn't get through hard hearts. They had a problem. Their eyes, Jesus said they've closed. And really it's interesting, while he's quoting it to that generation and those people, he's quoting out of Isaiah, which would have gone back 700 years before that, to people that were like that in the past who had closed their eyes and their ears are dull of hearing. Hebrews 5, beginning in verse 11, points out 
that when by reason of time you ought to be teachers, you have need that someone teach you again the rudiments of the first principles of God and have become dull of hearing. So the next passage in that list, Luke 8:18, 8, is quite significant. Jesus asked a group one time, how do you hear? Come and hear preaching Sunday morning, Sunday night, in a class Wednesday night? Am I taking notes? Am I studying at home? Am I hungering and thirsting? Or do I kind of carry the Bible around with me and I would say that I'm a student of the Bible and I'm missing the master in the process? Just measure it out in your own life. But it's sobering because that's that people. And 700 years before is the same kind of people and they didn't see too well what was flashed upon the screen. Of course, they couldn't have been doing that in the first century, but we have that now, something put before your eyes as well as hearing with your ears. And how does it get down to the heart and affect it? Does it melt the heart into a transformation until you are no longer conformed to this world, but you're transformed by the renewing of your mind, and you renew it this much, that you can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, Romans 12 and 2. That's the kind of challenge that goes with searching the Scriptures, that we're actually transformed, metamorpho, that much change from a worm to a butterfly. That's where we get the word, metamorphosis. And all that's dealing with this number three, proper motive. What kind of a student do we want to be and what kind of a student are we actually being? Another passage related to this might be sobering to think about right briefly and I probably better start kicking it in high gear because I'm dealing too much with details here, but they're important details. Matthew 13, 18 through 23 is where Christ explained to them the sowing of the seed in varied kinds of soil. You're probably familiar with the parable, so we won't go back to read it, but there were some seed that fell by the wayside. There were some seed that fell upon the rocky soil. There were some seeds that fell upon thorny soil, and then there were some seed that fell upon good soil. Sobering thing is he gives four classifications of soil, and in every single case he said, these are they who have heard the word. Who heard the word? The ones where it fell by the wayside. Who heard the word? the ones that were like the rocky soil. Who heard the word? The ones that were like the thorn-infested, weed-infested soil. And who heard the word? The ones that were the good soil. Every one of them. So we're not dealing in this context with heathen that never have seen the Bible or have a chance to study the Bible. We're dealing with people who've had the word. Not only had it, but heard it. And three out of four, if you want to put it on a percentage basis, produced nothing. And that's sobering again too, isn't it? The only ones that produced anything were those that were referred to as the good soil. And it's the only one of all the ones that heard it who said they really understood it. Check it out. Wayside soil, they never did really understand it. Devil comes along and snatches away what's been sown. Rocky soil, receive it. Sounds good. I want to obey. One year later, not even gathering with brethren. That happens. And they'd be like that. Or the thorny soil, pleasures of this world choke the word and they become unfruitful. Treasures of this world, pleasures of this world take over 
and they don't have time to get up their lesson for Sunday morning, or they do not really study the word at home or at the assembly. It's sobering. And as he put it down, three out of four, I do not try it any way here to indicate that that means that 75% of the people are going to be lost that hear the word and 25 will become good ground. But the way he gave it, it's three out of four who hear and do not come through in regard to handling aright the word of truth as we're going to be looking at here in a moment. But the good soil, it's important to notice, I believe, are the only ones that it says that they understood it. If you really understand what makes a healthy soul and spirit, then you will also be inclined to be the one who will produce 30, 60, or 100 fold. John 15 and 8 is one of the identifications that scripture gives in regard to who is a disciple. And it's someone who bears much fruit. I can still remember Sewell Auditorium, Abilene Christian, when I had a very happy moment in my heart because as they sang the invitation song that night, I saw <laughs> young man step out in the aisle and come down and stated that he wanted to be baptized into Christ. And it caused me to reflect back a few years before that when I had a gospel meeting at Spade, Texas, and the preacher had the audacity to say, it's not likely that anyone will go to heaven alone. Anyone who goes to heaven will have taken someone with him, and maybe many. Well, John 15 and 8 indicates that you bear much fruit, and so shall you be my disciples. That young man that stepped out that night being baptized is one I'd run around with for at least the last four years of our high school life at Spade. And I felt like his obeying the gospel was not completely likely, but largely due to my influence. And I thought, maybe I'll make it yet. Well, I don't want to make heaven look like a thing you work yourself into it. But I do say it in regard to, are you conscious of anyone you're trying to bring to Christ at the present? Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, and so shall you be my disciple. Who is a disciple? A great fruit bearer. Who is a disciple? Good ground that produces 30, 60, or 100 fold. Parallel there in some way. Well, let's move to uh, rule four. Rightly divide the word of truth. Don't intend to spend much time on this because as you looked at the A and B part, it's material that's been covered, I think, many times by brethren in the past. If you've been in Bible classes, You've likely seen the breakdown of the 39 books of the Old Testament and the 27 books of the New Testament in the order in which they're given there, which really doesn't help you understand them hardly at all, but it does become a starting point from which to study those 39 books. And so I'll not deal with anything except one thing out of that context. In Matthew 23, 35 through 36, Jesus mentioned something, and I'm just doing this to clarify what I have in the outline, lest you look at it and think, what in the world did he have in mind when he put down 2 Chronicles 24, 20, and 21 in relationship to Matthew 23, 35, and 36? Well, Jesus there speaks about the blood of Zechariah who was killed inside the temple, priest of God, corrupt, evil time in God's people. And the reason that I put Second Chronicles 24, 20, and 21 there is if you picked up a Hebrew Bible, not an English Bible, but a Hebrew, 
the last of the 39 books that the Hebrews have in their canon, the same as we have 39, does not end in Malachi. The last book in the Hebrew Bible is Second Chronicles. So when Jesus is scoping this expression about all of the blood but to the time of Zechariah, he's really saying throughout all the old covenant period of time. And uh, in case that caused you any confusion, it's the only reason I'm even mentioning it. But that's how Second Chronicles 24, 20, and 21 ties in with that. Now, let's just move beyond that down to point two. Rightly divide the word as to covenants God has made. Don't intend to spend much time on this. But here's a sweeping survey of the times when God has dealt with someone or some ones in a covenant relationship. One would be the instructions and directions he gave person to person during what would be generally called the antediluvian, before the deluge, before the flood period of time, down to the time of Noah. And God dealt with people then, person to person, as he walked in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day, according to Genesis. And then after that, you go a number of years Actually, it would be 2000 B.C., something like that, to the time of Abraham, and he gave a dual promise to Abraham. And thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed, and I will give to you this land where he was at that time sojourning. And so God made a covenant. And if we're to read all those passages down through Genesis, especially in the latter part there around uh, 21, 17, 1 through 14 in that area, you have the covenant that God made with Abraham, and then that covenant is even more, uh, I guess, dramatically expressed when he made the covenant of circumcision that on every eighth day any Jewish male child would be circumcised, and that was a sign between God and the Hebrews. And so there was that covenant with Abraham. Uh, toward the end of that, you've got Galatians 3, notice in part B, and that is an excellent chapter to tie all of this together because it brings in Abraham into the time after Christ had even died, been buried, been resurrected, and ascended back to the Father. And it deals with the fact that what had been given before as a promise to Abraham was fulfilled not to seeds as of many, but to thy seed, which is Christ. That's the one who would bless all nations that had been promised and a covenant promise made with Abraham. Third one, of course, was a covenant that came about 1500 B.C. when God brought his people out of Egyptian bondage and formed a covenant with them. Especially the first eight verses of Exodus 19 identifies the covenant factor and other passages would enlarge on that if we took time to look at it. But that would be really the books of the Old Covenant from Exodus through Malachi. All of those books are dealing primarily with God's covenant relationship with Israel in that Old Covenant area. From 1500 B.C. down to the close of the last prophet of the Old Covenant, Malachi. And then, of course, you come to the New Covenant, which is under Christ. But I think you're fairly familiar with all that, and I'm trying to hasten on to get down through Rule 15 if we can. Christ's covenant, you might note there, it's important to keep in mind, was for all nations and tribes and peoples. He had all authority in heaven and on earth. Matthew 18:28 is listed. 
It is an eternal covenant. That's clearly stated in Hebrews 13, 20, and 21, through which we can offer service well-pleasing to the Lord. Enter into a covenant relationship, do His will, and be well-pleasing to Christ the Savior. And then, of course, John 12, 48, by those words of that new covenant, we will be judged someday. You will be, I will be. I've mentioned the varied ones about when I got a traffic ticket in Indianapolis for speeding and uh, the time I sat in that courtroom about 15 were ahead of me and they kept going up and the judge would talk to each one of them and I just sitting back there sweating knowing my name was going to be called and then I went up when I went up I was up there by myself with the judge and he asked, uh, sir, how do you plead? He'd already read off what my ticket was, my speed was, in a zone that was, and all of that. And are you guilty? And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> he smiled and he said, well, and then he told me, I thought I was getting off pretty light. He said, we're gonna find you this much. And then he said, plus court costs, and I didn't realize that's about $80, and back then that's a week's salary. Well, anyhow, judgment day is not going to be a day you want to stand there and have to say what I did that day in court. Yes, sir, I'm guilty. Man, that, that didn't feel good then, and it still doesn't feel good, and I know it wouldn't feel good if I was standing before God as the judge. Sobering, but another covenant relationship. Now then, come to rightly divide the word, I think in an area here that we need to look at more carefully maybe. Part three, moral laws enforce duties and regulations that are right within themselves. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery even in the world and in worldly courts, these type activities are labeled as sin and wrong and deserve a penalty of some kind. It may vary from country to country, but everyone recognizes that there are certain basic rules, moral codes, we shouldn't lie one to another. We should not commit adultery. We should not steal. That reminds me, I've mentioned before, but you may not have been in the class some time ago about while I was teaching at sunset, and I asked varied classes, can any one of you here say you've never lied? Raise your hand. And here's a whole classroom of men planning to preach not a one ever raised their hand and the teacher didn't either and my guess is if I were to ask you would know somewhere back down the way that you lied well that's a moral thing we're not to lie to one another not to steal from one another kill one another and I don't believe we have much trouble in that area of recognizing that there are laws against moral violations. So that, that's not the problem. Problem comes later. Look at the second one. B, positive divine law, ah, this is different, makes things right not because they are inherently good or evil, but because they are required by divine authority. A few examples there, and I think you can easily pick up these. We can move past them without reading them. Passover lamb, certain restrictions. Get that lamb on a certain day. Keep it till a certain day. Kill it on a certain day. What you're to do with it when you kill it and how you are to eat it. All details. Put blood on the doorpost or chantels. And what will happen? Well, when death comes to the Egyptians, your family, your children will be spared. The death of the firstborn. 
And if you wanted to be critical, you might say, well, what in the world does killing a lamb have to do and putting blood on a doorpost with saving children? And really, the only reason that'd be true is because God said it. But now that's an important law that many people on this earth and many that claim to follow Christ are not getting. Look at the next one. Healing of Naaman. Old muddy Jordan River. Go down and dip in it seven times. Made him mad. Captain of a mighty force. And he was reluctant to even go. In fact, he got angry. I've got rivers back in my territory that are better than that one. Didn't make any sense to dip in the Jordan one time, much less seven, and the dirty river could bring about a cleansing of a leprous body? The only thing was, that's what God's prophet said do, wasn't it? And then you remember his steward talked him in to going on and dipping in the Jordan. And guess what happened on the seventh dip? Came up with flesh like a little baby, clean and pure. Only reason to do that, not because of any moral or common sense pattern, but because God said do it through the prophet that way. Then conquering Jericho. Now that's really a comedy. And I can imagine what was going on inside. Well, I, I think I know what might have been happening inside Jericho. You see the Israelite army march around every day. Priests out in front. Trumpets are blowing. People look at that and think that's a way to cause the walls of a city to crumble. Doesn't make any military sense at all. On Saturday, they got up and marched around even more times. And then they were to blow the horns and shout, and the walls came tumbling down. It worked, but the only reason it made sense is because they did what God said that didn't have any common sense. These are positive divine laws that make no meaning except God said do it that way. The brazen serpent, look up at a serpent and it'll cure you of a snake bite. Now that didn't come from the doctor to take to the pharmacist and work it out. Baptism is a command like that. And think of how much trouble that's caused in the religious world since the first century. Baptism doth now save you. Number two says, sometimes you can see there's no good in the act commanded to obtain the promise illustrated in the above cases. You can see no good. Peter even added when he mentioned about our being baptized that we might be saved from our sins and have a good conscience before God. It's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Just doing what we do and someone walking down in the baptistry and putting them under the water and they come up out of there, that's not a good bath. Well, you need some type of soap that's maybe doctored up a little bit to get your body really clean if you're dirty, putting away the filth of the flesh. And so it makes no sense as a way to cleanse one from sin except that's what Jesus said do. Sometimes we can see there's no good. And then number three, sometimes we can see what's required is morally wrong. And I believe one of the preachers this past Sunday dealt, didn't Marty give us a lesson in regard to going up on Mount Moriah and offering up the Son, the promised Son, the only Son with a promise for Abraham to sacrifice. 
Now, it's wrong, and that's the reason we have 2 Kings 21, 1 through 6 down there. God condemned Manasseh when he offered his children up as a sacrifice. Of course, he was doing it to Baal or Ashtaroth. But the idea of sacrificing a child on an altar is repudiating to God and man. And yet, God told Abraham to do it. But I won't bother to cover much more than Marty did on that subject of God testing Abraham's faith. So their command, that was a command though, and the passage in Hebrew indicates that it was a test of faith and that thereby God even affirmed that he knew was a man of faith. Number four on this next page, you might look at the emphasis of 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. Now that's where your positive divine law comes in. You may not see any particular reason for it. It may not make good common sense as a remedy, but if God said do something, then it is imperative that we do it and do it the way he said do it. So important. Well, number four then, rightly divide the word by dispensations. This has also been done about like the part on the preceding page as to how many books were biography and how many were dealing with prophecy and so forth. Here we have it by time. Patriarchal period. Patri is the Greek term and archos is the Greek term. Father rule. And during the time when God primarily related to the fathers of the household and the household took care of disseminating that information to the family, during that period of time when there was not a national body of people with whom God dealt, he dealt with them person to person, so to speak. And during that patriarchos, patriarchal period of time, need to know what was involved there. And then in the Jewish period of time related to Israel are to proselytes to the Israeli faith coming under that covenant that we've already talked about. And that period, not intending to take time on these, the Christian era I'm going to touch on only in one regard. There's a beautiful passage listed under part C of the era and time in which you and I are now living and has been true ever since Christ arose from the dead and said all authority has been given into me, unto me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 18. That period forward, the new covenant now could go into force. The argument in the Hebrew letter in regard to a will or a testament not being in force until the testator dies. Well, Christ had died. Of course, he also had been resurrected. And now that covenant of his went into force. And we are living unto this day under that covenant and will continue until he returns again. The one passage I want us to look at, you see listed there, 1 Corinthians 9, 20 through 22. Excellent passage for two or three reasons. So it's one you'd like to, I hope, imprint on your brain to the point you could remember to turn to it at any time because it clarifies a number of circumstances. Attitudes, rules, Law, no law, and all of it's in one context. So it's a good passage to remember. Uh, Matthew, could you tell me where I just said that's located in what book? I'm just seeing if everybody's going to catch it. Harold, you, did you catch that? Yeah. Now, all of you will remember it, I'm sure now. Let's turn there and look at that for just a moment. Paul wrote, To the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain Jews. Here's a beautiful principle as to motive and attitude. 
You remember in the book of Acts, it mentions about Paul taking Timothy and circumcising him. Well, if you were to look in Acts 15, you'd find that actually Paul stood up quite straight and emphasized that circumcision was no longer a law that a Gentile had to obey. There's a big controversy about that in 1 Corinthians 15. Galatians 5 and 6 said, In Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything but faith working through love. And so it's quite obvious that Paul did not think Timothy had to be circumcised. Why would he do it? Because later in this context, he said, I'll do all things to save some. Go as far as you can. And that's one of the great and beautiful principles in this. Try to understand the other person. Philippians 2, 19 and 20, Paul said of all the great helpers he had, I have none like Timothy. And then he mentioned the trait in Timothy that was better than all the others. And that trait was, I have no man like-minded who will truly care for your state. Now I can look at you and hear you say something and know it's not in Scripture and immediately try to get you straightened out. But it might be a lot easier to do that if I am mindful of your background and your thinking and why you have done what you've done, understanding the other person. I have no man who will like, uh-oh, have no man like-minded who will truly care for your state. Man, it's hard. And it's not easy and it isn't really natural. Timothy was unique. That I can look at you or you can look at me and you can look into my background and understand why I'm thinking like I'm thinking are doing what I'm doing. Now that's what's here in Paul having Timothy to be circumcised because he'd be among Jews and they would listen better to Timothy. You go as far as you can, even to the physical pain of healing and recovery from a circumcision when you are up the age Timothy was at that time. Look at the rest of this. To the Jews, I became a Jew. Paul would do the same thing he'd asked Timothy to do. Jews, I became a Jew. Why? That I might gain the Jews. Beautiful spirit. Them that are under the law as under the law. And then he added this, not being myself under the law. Now there is a good, solid passage to remember that Paul taught us by inspiration that he was not under Moses' law. And neither are you and neither am I. Conflict recently in our day about whether to put the Ten Commandments down on the lawn of the state capitol. One of those laws is what? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We're not even under that law. And the Ten Commandments, I'm not disparaging the number of good things in them, but I'm just saying we're not under that law. And one reason I know it is right there. To those that are under the law, Paul said, I will follow along as though I'm under the law. Do we have in the book of Acts an account where Paul actually did a Nazarite vow and things? In order to relate to the Hebrew people, he sure did. He'd go as far as he could. Still a beautiful attitude. Yet, if you pin him down, he says this. But not being myself under the law. That just settles it. He wasn't under that law. You're not under that law. I'm not under that law. That I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law. Not being without law to God, but under law to Christ. I was intending to cover here in, in the book that I have out in regard to where men have put are, where God put and. 
And it's caused confusion and trouble over and over again. And this principle right here is a part of it. We're under grace and not under law. That's a lie. It's a lie. We're under grace, which includes the law of Christ. Look at it. To them that are without law as without law, not being myself without law to God, but under law to Christ. Now, the law of Christ is bathed in grace. And we need to appreciate that grace and teach it as it should be taught. But it scares me a little bit when the, the pendulum's got to swing and we're not under law, we're under grace. No, we're under law of Christ, which is grace. And you need to get the balance. Let me just read to you right briefly because the bell's about to ring. Where uh, these factors. In regard to Christ's precepts, the very number one I have on the list is grace and law is right, but the world is basically saying grace or law. We're not under law, we're under grace. Look at the next one. Faith and works. That's the way it is in Scripture. But the world is saying, faith, our works. A lot of those people in the Church of Christ trying to work themselves to go to heaven. And that's not the point at all. But if we're going to walk by faith, as I mentioned a moment ago, and not by sight, we better realize that faith to the Lord means to keep his commandments because he's the author of salvation to what? All of them that obey him. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. It's the balance. It's not or, it's and. Grace and law, faith and works, belief and baptism. Infant baptism nullifies belief. Baptize, they say they're baptizing a baby, but the baby can't believe. And so they, that's where the devil again puts R in place of and. But when Jesus sent them out, go preach the gospel to every creature, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. It's not one or the other, it's one and the other. And then Christ of the church. I remember about in the 1950s and 60s, the man of the plan. And the emphasis was some were trying to relate to Christ but didn't care for the church. And then there are some people like to go to a church because their friends go there, but they never do convert to Christ. It's not one or the other, it's Christ and the church. And he'll be the savior of the body of the church, Ephesians 5. I realize my time is up. If you have any questions from uh, six on down to 15, I'll be happy to study with you anytime or call me up or, and I hope you will study these others because there are some good suggestions there on not just having the word but being a good student of it. You're dismissed.